I moved, I actually used to live on the East Coast, um, and yeah, I just happened to move to the West Coast uh, about eight or nine years ago, but I wasn't raised in North America, I wasn't born or raised in North America, I was um, born and raised in different parts of India and the Global South, and um, my parents were migrant workers, my dad in particular was a migrant worker for very many, many years, so um yeah, I came to Turtle Island, now known as North America, approximately 15 years ago. So that's how I came to North America, and then eventually came to the West Coast. Cool. Could you summarize your analysis of border imperialism? Sure. Um, I'll try my best. Yeah, yeah. I mean... uh, the main piece of land is, um, is that border imperialism is as uh, an alternative framework for talking about um, issues around immigration. So there's different pieces to it, but overall, um, border imperialism, the intent of an analysis around border imperialism is to shift the conversation um, that we see, particularly in the U.S. and Canada, as one that's very domesticated. Mm. So, you know, most conversations are focused on domestic policy. So how many deportations are happening, um, you know, whether governments are contributing to the economy or not, how much they're contributing to the economy, um, how many should we let in, how many should we get rid of, like those kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and even, you know, the kind of progressive liberal conversations are focused on fairer treatment for immigrants, right, so that we shouldn't detain them as much, those kinds of things. Um, or conversations around things like the DREAM Act, which is that you know, there should be a humane pathway to citizenship. Um, but again, all these conversations are really focused on immigration as a domestic policy issue and what the state or the government should or shouldn't do in relationship to immigration without looking at much broader and I would argue much more important questions of, well, why and how do patterns of immigration exist in the first place? Mm -hmm. Where are immigrants coming from? Where are people being displaced from? Um, and also what function does immigration serve within the global political economy? Um, and so for me, border imperialism is looking at the cycles of displacement. So, you know, of course, that it, there's, it's not a coincidence that most of the people who are immigrating are from the global south to the global north, um, or people who are migrating from poor areas um, to kind of urban centers, even within borders. So these patterns of displacement are, are marked by, um, you know, factors like colonialism and, and capitalism and histories of, of imperialism, of structural adjustment, of, um, you know, quote-unquote modernization of agriculture, those kinds of things. Um, and so that's kind of a key piece, which is how is, is the West implicated, particularly the West, not just the West, but particularly historically um, the West in terms of... Uh, its foreign policy, how is the West implicated in displacing people in the first place mm -hmm. from their lands and their communities? And then the flip side of that is, you know, how is the West implicated in making people precarious when they migrate? So, you know, what are the forces of incarceration, um, the forces of, um, you know, illegalization, if you will, so mm -hmm. by declaring people quote unquote the legal how it makes them vulnerable particularly to bosses and employers and that that's not a coincidence right because even though we'd like to believe that the state really wants to get rid of all undocumented migrants I would argue that that's actually you know that's the rhetoric that that doesn't benefit the state because mm -hmm. the state wants a labor force that's vulnerable mm -hmm. and exploitable and, and really targetable so it's actually in the state's best interest to keep undocumented people within the economy because then they work for less than minimum wage. Um, so all of these things together kind of inform border imperialism as a very deliberate process of creating and sustaining precarious migrants um, through forces of displacement and criminalization. I'm wondering how, how that analysis came about. Was that you reading a lot of books and sitting in a room by yourself, or was that you actually getting out there and organizing and working with people and having conversations? Like, how did that? How did how did how did you how were you able to define this analysis so 
um, clearly, I guess. Um, well, I mean, the thing that's always weird about writing is that it gets ascribed to one person, and right. definitely, you know, what I'm saying isn't new. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it may kind of, it comes across as, you know, with different pieces of, of analysis that have been put together, but certainly it's a mix of other people's um, writing, mm-hmm. uh, you know, which the book obviously cites. It's a lot of it is based on um, lived experience. As I mentioned, I come from a family that's been displaced and has been migrating for decades. Um, it also comes from the experiences of other migrants. And it comes from, you know, having spent a lot of time at this point over a decade specifically within the migrant justice movement. So mm-hmm. um, being part of a lot of conversations with other migrant justice organizers, um, being alongside other migrants who are experiencing, you know, these daily patterns of precarity and poverty, um, and spending a lot of time dealing with policy at the same time, right? Because mm-hmm. in the movement, you kind of have to um, be way, way more informed about um, what informs mm-hmm the kind of policies around immigration. And so, yeah, it's definitely a mixture of a lot of things, but I would definitely say that what I'm saying isn't uh, new. It Mm -hmm. has been articulated in different forms, in different ways, um, by whether it's writers, but in particular by organizers for a very long time. So um, it's just put together in a particular way and given a framework, if you will. Right. Um, Right. But, yeah, it's based on decades and decades of collective theorizing and collective organizing. I noticed that throughout the book, when you talk about no one is illegal Vancouver, you put in parentheses uh, indigenous coast Salish territories. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering, um, and, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm, I'm, could you tell us why, why you did that? Yeah, I mean, Vancouver in particular, I use um, indigenous coast Salish territories because Vancouver in particular um, but, of course, all of Turtle Island mm-hmm. is land that has been occupied. Um, you know, North America is not the U.S. and Canada and Mexico. Um, it's Turtle Island, and it's, you know, other words that are indigenous to different people's languages to mm-hmm. signify place and location. And so Vancouver is itself uh, was a city that was incorporated, quote-unquote, just 125 years ago. Um, but prior to that... Um, and, of course, ongoing is the reality that the city is built on the lands of the, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people, which are the three different First Nations and Indigenous nations that make up the lands where I live. Um, and, you know, this land has never been ceded. Um, there's never been a treaty signed. This is obviously um, an illegal occupation of the land. And so for me, it's important to name that, um, both because I think it's important for people reading to always remember Mm -hmm. that the places where we live and the cities that we take so much for granted Mm -hmm. um, are built upon the ruins of Indigenous people's histories and communities and nations. Um, And also, you know, because for me, whenever I reference Vancouver in general, um, I always reference that it's, you know, again, it's actually Indigenous Coast Salish territories, not Vancouver. So it's an acknowledgement um, that I take seriously for myself as someone living on stolen land and also a reminder to all of us collectively um, that we, we need to be doing that kind of work and remembering and realizing that constantly mm-hmm. uh, when we're organizing because so much of um, the organizing that we do actually invisibilizes Indigenous people's struggles isn't taken as seriously as it should be. I'm picking up also in the book that, you know, uh, No One is Illegal Canada has um, relationships with Indigenous people from across Canada. And I'm wondering, um, and you, you've kind of talked about it with your, your last response, but like, wh- why is that important work to do? And how does that figure into uh no one is legal Canada. Yeah. Um, well, there, I mean, no one is legal isn't centralized. So in a sense that there are lots of no one is legal groups in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, and different no one is legals have different kind of principles and practices around working 
in relationship to Indigenous peoples and communities. I mean, I think well, generally there's a shared ethic, but um, I can comment more on the city where I'm located, uh, so, just because, again, we're not a centralized kind of organization. Okay. Um, but in terms of, yeah, in terms of known as legal in Vancouver, it is, it's definitely a priority um, of our movement organizing to be in solidarity and in alliance with Indigenous communities. Um, and I would say definitely across Canada that that is um, a priority for all different known as legal groups, and it's mm-hmm. really based on the idea that you know no social movement can really organize itself without also being in solidarity and taking seriously the reality of settler colonialism, mm-hmm. particularly for known as legal, where we're talking about things like displacement and colonization and capitalism and imperialism in a global sense. When we look at you know where we're living in our, our very local context, then those forces locally most impact Indigenous people. You know, Indigenous people have been completely displaced off their territories in North America and Turtle Island. Um, and, you know, so again, I would argue that any immigrant rights movement, climate justice movement, needs to consider that as a, a central point, not just kind of a tangential point, but a central point of organization. Um, and then, of course, you know, other issues Um, within migrant justice movements, whether we're talking about racism or poverty or incarceration, um, at least in Canada, the highest rates of those are experienced by Indigenous people, again, as as a result of the legacy of settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. So um, for us, you know, to be meaningfully talking about things like place and belonging um, and building home. Um, and, you know, resisting deportation and displacement and detention means that we need to be doing that in alliance with other communities who are experiencing that at a local level. And in, um, and so building alliances with Indigenous communities has been a priority and people have worked to uh, create those alliances um, in, in very meaningful ways. And as you mentioned, the book kind of, you know, I'm not going to go into that what it necessarily looks like, because the book does articulate some of those different relationships and long-term processes that have led to really beautiful and incredible solidarities and conversations and, and dialogues, and for me, it's some of the most important works that we're doing um, in terms of, uh, of building alliances, but I do think that, um, you know, that's something that particularly in the U.S., that the immigrant rights movement generally, obviously I can't comment on, um, right. what specific organizers in the U.S. are doing. But from afar, what seems like the kind of general immigrant rights movement, and perhaps it's the mainstream one, um, that seems to be very absent mm-hmm. from conversations. And one of the things that that does is not only, you know, separate migrant and indigenous communities from each other, but it also means then there's an increased tendency to... Um, rely on the state for solutions because if we realize that North America from its very founding is based on things like, you know, genocide and slavery um, and we know our history and we understand that history and we understand that framework, like a political framework, then the immigrant rights movement becomes less, um, falls less into the trap of thinking that the government is going to be our savior, or that what we need to do is just assimilate and integrate and become, quote-unquote, good U.S. or Canadian citizens. Um, And I think, you know, understanding settler colonialism, for example, and or genocide and and slavery as central organizing features of the North American state and being in solidarity with the communities affected by those processes means that instead of articulating a really statist kind of discourse, we end up having a much more profound anti-colonial, um, anti-statist discourse. And so, um, you know, in addition to being in solidarity because it's principled, I think it also takes us down a different path in terms of how we envision our movements being organized and where our solutions lie. And I think that is definitely a big difference between the migrant justice movement um, Again, not all parts of it, but kind of mm-hmm. broadly understood and generally understood um, between the U.S. and Canada. So I'm, I'm also curious how those relationships started. 
um, I know in New York State, there's definitely like, um, you know, the Iroquois Nation who has been trying to, you know, um, fight for their land rights and to fight to have treaties recognized by New York State who basically just, and the federal government who don't, don't do that. Um, and so I'm wondering how, how, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, solidarity delegations and I'm wondering sort of what those look like and how you would reach out or how, how does this process of, um, uh, of building the solidarity and, and relationships work, I guess? I don't know. I'm curious. I mean, it's, it's hard to answer because... Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe, there's there probably not a formula, like but... It's you built know. between any communities, right? Right. Uh, there's lots of examples. I mean, we can kind of ask any... Take any scenario and example between different communities and ask how solidarity built, but hmm. um, it's hard to answer because ultimately they're they're relational. Right, right. Um, and, and they're long-term relations and they're processes of engagement and listening and learning and and humility and their ways of orienting ourselves rather than kind of a step-by-step, step one, step two, step three. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to answer, but it really is just built in the ways in which any form of solidarity is built between different movements and different communities, which is essentially, you know, reaching out, expressing an intention to be in solidarity and be in alliance and to, you know, offer support and kind of go from there and see how a relationship evolves. That, that, that's a nice segue into um, my next question, which, um, like, like I said, I was really interested in, in you discussing and explaining with examples and, you know, in, in the writing, how uh, the work is kind of done, the practice is used. And I'm I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about what direct support work is. Yeah, direct support work is um, takes many forms. But it's basically the idea that you know, in addition to um, kind of fighting detentions and deportations and other aspects of the immigration system broadly, in terms of you know whether it's fighting against a specific policy or taking action against the system or what have you, that um, we're also organizing kind of day-to-day in support of specific individuals and specific families that are dealing with the system, again, specifically in relationship to detention and deportation, um, and that our work is grounded, um, you know, in those actual lived experiences and is is grounded in supporting people kind of where they're at. Um, and so it's, it's a balance, right? Because a lot of activism and movement organizing happens um, in kind of these big ways, you know, mm-hmm. so large public actions, large public campaigns, um, but often not necessarily meeting the day-to-day needs of the communities who are most impacted. And so for us, support work is is that, is how do we fight in a big collective public way and how do we also meet the needs of our communities um, who are being impacted on a daily basis, who are, you know, filling up prisons and being deported constantly. So support work is the idea of, of fighting alongside people who are needing support within the system. Um, and so in some ways it's, you know, it's like, doing legal advocacy, court support, fundraising, those kinds of things, Mm -hmm. Um, but doing it on the basis of solidarity and not charity. So, you know, we don't see ourselves as social workers or, um, you know, uh, other kinds of um, state or NGO kind of bureaucratized people who kind of, quote unquote, help immigrants, but it's to provide those kinds of support, but from a different place. Um, and a place of uh, um, knowing that, or of understanding that people are the best leaders of their own struggle, um, but what they might need is support to break the isolation, um, and also that that is part of a process of politicization too, because once people um, see that they're supported by other people, they're much more willing and interested in political struggle, because a big part of the immigration system, of course, is to create isolation and also fear. Um, There's a lot of fear of fighting back, because then you're worried that you're more likely to be detained or deported, for example. That's a very 
very real fear. It's a shared across um, migrants. And so breaking that isolation and breaking that fear is a very important part of being involved in political struggle. Um, and so what it looks like is, again, very different things. Um, it looks like very tangible forms of support, as I mentioned, like legal advocacy, mm-hmm. translation support, you know, accompanying people to their appointments, mm-hmm. um, going with people to immigration offices, which is a big deal because, again, you know, if you're someone who doesn't have full legal status, stepping into an immigration office is the most terrifying thing you'll do, and it'll keep you up for days. And mm-hmm. um, offering those kinds of supports, offering emotional support, um, things like child care support, uh, just a range of whatever people might need in order to feel um, more supported and secure in their struggle. And then, of course, some of these struggles also become then, over time, public campaigns because people decide to fight their deportation or detention in a much more public way by taking it to the media, by having rallies, and so then support looks like you know, organizing um, alongside people to build campaigns as well. So it's a range of kind of invisible labor um, and kind of emotional labor and um, legal support to much more public kind of campaigns in support of people. And what it looks like entirely depends on the situation and most of all what people want and need. I, mean, I guess I'm curious, like, you know, if if I were to come to known as Illegal Vancouver and want to get involved, is there like a set of trainings or like do you lay out the analysis or is it more organic? Um, somewhere in, in the book you talk about how um, it's important that we see ourselves building relationships as opposed to building like numbers of people or, you know, statistics of people that are, you know, quote unquote in support. But um I wonder, like, how how would that work if if like I wanted to get involved with no one is illegal Vancouver? Do do I do? Is it like I come to a meeting? Is it? Do you have like a set of trainings? Is it um, more organic than that? Like I, I I was just trying to get a grasp on like what what that looks like for. And 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 that's coming from a privileged perspective as well. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean it's um. It's a mix of all of those things. Um, I mean, the main thing is that we're an all-volunteer collective. Mm -hmm. We're not a staffed organization. Um, So, you know, people who commit to the collective commit to it in their capacity as volunteer organizers. And, um, you know, there's a a certain kind of commitment, obviously, when you're not a staff member. Um, Or when you're not working for a staffed organization, even. Mm -hmm. And you're a grassroots collective. But the process looks like, I mean, there's different ways of being involved. Mm -hmm. If people want to just kind of support and find out about events, then that just looks like, you know, hey, fine, give us your email, we'll let you know when there's an event. If people want to be more actively involved, there's different ways. We have um, a group of people that we call on who may not be as interested in kind of active decision making because... Um, that's just not what they're interested in doing, but want to support on a more kind of regular weekly, monthly basis, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and help us, you know, want to support with specific things like um, translation or people offer up their homes, Mm -hmm. for example, when someone's looking for a place to stay, um, who's facing deportation, safe houses, those kinds of things. Um, For that, there's, you know, a really specific way of getting involved and we get in touch with people, we meet with them, find out what people are interested in. Mm-hmm. In terms of joining the active collective, which means, um, you know, active decision-making, taking responsibility for the work of the, of the group, um, that's a, you know, a much more kind of tiered process where, um, you know, we ask people to commit, to, you know, to make a time commitment. Mm-hmm. Um, we ask people to commit to, you know, base, basic principles, like our basis of unity and other things. Um, and, yeah, then we go through uh, an orientation process where we go through how we work, what we work on, what we believe in, et cetera. And then at the end, you know, we, we jointly decide if that's still something that people are interested in, in doing as being part of the collective. So um, the levels of involvement and the process that one goes through depends on how involved someone wants to be and what kind of involvement they want to take on. 
But again, because we're, you know, an all-volunteer collective, we have to be definitely very intentional Mm -hmm. um, about uh, how we're structured. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, yeah, because we also want to build capacity and trust and and leadership. So um, it's organic in some ways, but it's also intentional because, you know, just bringing people into a meeting where they're lost about what's going on um, may seem like it's welcoming, but in some ways it's not at all. Right, right. People have no idea what's going on. So um, definitely one of the things that we try to do is keep building intentionality and skill sharing within our our organizing um, rather than assuming that, uh, you know, the, I, the ways in which a lot of anarchist organizing happens that people believe is organic is actually often alienating. So mm-hmm. we try to counter that intentionally. I've got you for a, a, a couple more minutes here, and I'm wondering if you can tell us how we decolonize. <laughs> <laughs> in, in four minutes, three minutes. I so can't like, yeah. can answer that. <laughs> um, do, do, I, I noticed in, in, in toward the, the last section you kind of talk about um, healing justice. And I'm wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about that, and then we'll we'll end it. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, the last part of the book, I talk a, a, a bit about, like you mentioned, healing justice, and also talk about it in the kind of in the framework of how we're organized internally in terms of our relationships to each other within the community. Um, and for me, that's it's an important concept because you know, for a long, long time, we've been aware within our movements that we're dealing with things like burnout, Mm -hmm. um, lack of sustainability, um, lack of intergenerational connectivity, um, and just a range of, of issues that really force us to reflect on, you know, how are we organizing? And for me, I think one of the, you know, there's two things that are key to organizing. Um, one is of course, you know, our analysis and our practice of organizing, kind of externally in our, our relationships with the world and the systems that we're confronting. And the second part of it is, you know, how do we organize ourselves internally? And the latter um, doesn't receive as much attention, at least not collectively, right? We might talk about it with some of our friends or some of our groups, mm-hmm. but there's not a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of analysis about why the world is Raw, you know, fucked up, and what's wrong with the world? But there's not a lot of analysis of how do we go about actually creating movements that will change that. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, especially ones that are sustainable and intergenerational and and inclusive and welcoming and all of those things. Um, and even concepts like you know anti-oppression are theorized, but how do we actually practice them? Or mm-hmm. concepts like community accountability that everyone's talking about, but no one really knows how to practice it. Mm-hmm. Um, or not no one, but, you know, there's this feeling of, of not knowing how to actually make it work. And so, for me, um, kind of healing justice and emotional justice and community care and all these concepts are um, are really, really important, particularly in how we embody them and how seriously we take them. And the one thing that I've noticed, and, you know, I feel like this is probably a shared experience with people, is the kinds of movements that um, sustain people and also so you know kind of keep people in the movement um and the kind of movements that also sustain people's own energy and makes people want to keep going are ones where people have built strong relationships with each other Mm -hmm. and so the things that keep us in movements is not our shared analysis but it's our shared relationship Mm -hmm. and so healing justice becomes a big part of that um, because healing justice is just one part of how we connect with each other um, and, you know, build intimate relationships. And that doesn't mean, for me anyway, doesn't necessarily mean that we all have to be friends with everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Like, movements are large and diverse and, you know, we all have different personalities. It doesn't mean that we all have to be friends and all live in a communal house <laughs> and all do everything together all the time. Right. Um, because otherwise then we're also great quickie. But to me... Um, Emotional justice and community care means that at a basic level, whether we're friends or not, that we show each other basic care and respect um, within our movements and so that our relationships to each other are not mediated just by, you know, who's coming to meetings and how many meetings someone's going to, um, 
and you know how much work and productivity people are performing, but actually treating each other like human beings. So you know when people are going through things, checking in with people um, and providing emotional labor and support and care. And this is important to name, you know, for the reasons that I just mentioned, which is that this is how we build strong and resilient communities. But it's also important to name within our organizing because this is labor that's very gendered. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think few people would disagree that most of that work of of doing emotional work and emotional labor is sustained by women in our movements, mm -hmm. is sustained by trans folks and gender queer folks in our movements. Um, and so naming that labor is really important if we're going to shift the dynamics of patriarchy mm -hmm. um, within our movement. Because, you know, one of the ways in which patriarchy most manifests itself in, in terms of interpersonal relationships is that lack of emotional care and labor that, um, you know, cisgendered men are socialized into. Mm -hmm. So it's also important to name for that reason um, in order to shift those patterns and dynamics and to make visible how much labor that actually is. Um, and so, you know, healing justice kind of falls within that framework, uh, which is that we need to take care of each other. And it's also very different from self-care, I would argue, um, because self-care um, can be very individualized. It can be really based on kind of capitalist consumption patterns. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea that you just go off on a retreat um, or buy things you need or, or that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. so for me, um, self-care is not something... I have personally a lot of issues with the idea of self-care. I think it's been appropriated by the market and a lot of activists kind of perpetuate that. Mm -hmm. Whereas healing justice is based less on individualism Mm -hmm. um, and it's based on kind of collectivity, which is what do we need together? Um, and, you know, what are the things that our community needs collectively in order for everyone to feel supported and sustained? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's one piece of how do we strengthen our community um, by being present, really. That's just all it is. How do we, be, it's not all it is, but it's not a hard thing to understand yeah. in terms of how do we um, value each other as, as whole human beings and not reproduce the idea of activists as um, kind of being hyper-producing right. beings and, and machines. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm glad we were able to work it out. All right. Thanks so much. Thank it's you good so to much.